The next thing I'm going to do is to set up some global illumination. And I'm going to be using the standard mantra renderer for this tutorial. So what we need to do, as you'll remember from the global illumination videos, is we need to lay down a light template. Uh, let's just switch off the re-rendering and switch to our scene view. We need a light template in uh, the scene and we also need here in the shop to have a mantra global illumination light and we then need to on the render tab of, of the light that we laid down set the light shader to point to that GI light that we just created and let me look at the parameters of that GA light. I'm going to turn down the sampling quality for the purposes of the tutorial because I want this to render relatively fast. Obviously, in a real situation, you would want to have a reasonably good sampling quality. Now, for the moment, I'm going to choose full irradiance. And I'm going to choose full irradiance, and I'm going to use an environment map. And I'm going to use that for the same reason that I used it in the reflections. I want uh, the lighting coming into this uh, this object to reflect uh, the background image. So again, I'm going to choose uh, the background image as our environment right map. And I'm going to enable adaptive sampling. And then let's have another look and see what our render looks like. And of course it's going to be slower because we're creating calculating the global illumination. So in fact what I'm going to do perhaps I think that's rendering fast enough. I won't pause the video. Quite a subtle effect but probably one uh, that's worth having. Well, we're using these environment maps. Uh, we're using the background image as an environment map in this case, but you might have a separate environment map taken at the same time that the background image was taken. But whether we're using uh, whatever we're using in here, we need to make sure that it's aligned so that the brightest areas of the environment map correspond to the direction of the sun that we've established using the directional light. For example, if we had our environment map orientated so that the brightest areas were over here, this would tend to create shadows on our object when we use global illumination that point in this direction. And that would obviously conflict with the overall direction of the lighting, which is pointing slightly in this direction. Fortunately, there is a way to control the orientation of your environment map, and you can do it using an object. And there are several ways that you can test uh, the orientation. The one I'm going to use is to put a large reflective sphere into our scene temporarily and have a look and see what we get. So I'm going to take our reflective shader and I'm going to control C and control V to copy it. And I'm now going to call it reflective test. And I'm going to revert a couple of these parameters to their defaults. but it's still got the environment map set up here. And now I'm going to lay down a sphere into our scene. And I'm going to increase the size of it a bit so that we can see things quite clearly. And I'm going to give it uh, that reflective material that we just laid down, the reflective test material. And if we have a look at the options for the reflective material, we can see down at the bottom here there's something called env map space. And what we can do is choose use other object. And that will allow us to use an object, the transforms of an object in the scene as the space which our environment is going to be calculated in. And I've done a video tutorial on coordinate systems, so if you find all of this a bit difficult to follow, it's worth watching that video. Let's uh, say that we're going to use an object called env. So I obviously need to create an object called env. And I'm going to use a null to do that. And I'm going to call it 
n. Now, we can't just use the transforms of this object straight away in rendering. We need to make sure that Mantra gets hold of the map coordinate system, that it's exported into Mantra. And we can do that here on the Render tab of the Null, where it says Output Transform as Render Space. And we need this enabled for, uh, for our uh, transformations on here to have any effect. So let's for the moment leave it uh, with no transformations and have a look at how that renders. And what we should see is a large ball. And in fact, I'm going to stop this because I want to turn off global illumination temporarily to make it slightly faster to render. So back to the render view, re-render. And we can see that we're getting our environment reflected quite nicely there on the sphere. And in general, uh, the sphere is orientated according to your view. So we need to use the transforms here to transform it. So let me just try rotating it a bit around, say, the z-axis. Let's translate it by, say, 30 degrees, 40 degrees. Now, nothing's happened here. We're getting exactly the same image. And the reason is that, unfortunately, the uh, interactive render view here does not update this unless you press the re-render button, in which case it will. And we can now see that this has been quite dramatically changed. And that sun is now the reflection, rather, of our direction light, the, the specular highlight from our direction light, is now in the middle of the sky, which is, which is a, a lighter area. The rest of this isn't really going to matter because we, aren't, we haven't got any terribly precise reflections here, so we could probably leave it like this. Obviously, if you have a scene where you've got really quite uh, clear reflective objects, you're going to be, need to be much more careful about what environment map you use and, and how you orientate it. But this is really just to demonstrate how you can orientate an environment map. So I've done that. I'll switch that off. And the key point to remember, as I said earlier, is that in order for these transforms to be visible to the renderer, you have to have this enabled output transform as render space. Let me go back to our shading environment. And on the GI light, I'm also going to want to enable, let's go back to for the radiance, I'm also going to want to enable the null object here, which is, in other words, the object which is going to be used to transform our environment. And I'm going to set that also to the same thing. And I can turn off my sphere so that we're not going to have this dominating our scene. And there we are, it's disappeared. So that's how to orientate your environment maps in Houdini. Well, now let's look at setting up some render passes. And in Houdini and in other 3D applications, render passes are used interchangeably to mean separate renders which output different parts of the image or different aspects of the image. But they're also used to mean the ability of most modern renderers, including Mantra, to output a number of different planes of information at once. And we can see this most clearly if we have a look at our output node. And here it is. And I'm going to enlarge this so that we can see it. And here on the Properties tab, on the Output tab, we can see we've got something here called Extra Image Planes. By default, if I render, and we can't see it here using the interactive render view, I'll have to render using the mantra, the, the, the standard mplay. And it's complaining I don't have a license. Let's just check that these renders are, in fact, finished. Let's try again. So if I render to mplay, as I've just done, uh, we can see that uh, 
we should start seeing our chair emerging. Of course, the background image is not uh, being rendered. Let me just stop this because, in fact, I don't need it to render. We can see that uh, there's a dialog box up here which just contains the letter C. And that's an image plane. By default, what we get is a C plane. This contains four components, red, green, blue, and alpha. So we can see those, red, green, blue, and then the alpha. So by default, we're just getting a color plane with our render. And obviously, it would be very efficient if we were able to output at the same time some of the other information we might want to use in compositing. And for most of the render passes that we're going to do, you can, in fact, do that. So let me try adding one of them. I'm going to add an extra image crane. And it's got something here called vex variable. And you get a drop-down list here, which lists some of the standard variables that you can put in here. And I'm going to go for material paint export. Okay, So let's put that in and see what it looks like. The VEX type is either basically vector or float. Vector means that the output you're expecting is a color. And float, of course, it's a single float value. You don't necessarily need to name the channel. It will default to having the same name as this fix variable. The quantization determines the uh, extent of detail that you want uh, in the output. You can either have an 8-bit integer, 16-bit integer, and so on. I'm going to go for a 16-bit float, which is also the standard for the, the main color image that we're getting. And the filtering is quite important. Uh, I did a video earlier on outputting z-depth using this method. Uh, for that, you need to be very careful about the sample filter that you set. But in this case, we can leave it, for most uh, render passes, we can leave it at opacity filtering. And I'm also going to inherit the pixel filter from the main plane. And if we leave that blank, we see that that happens. And we can leave all of these settings at the same. So what will happen now when we render and this is again take a rather long time because we've got global illumination enabled so I'm just going to let it render a little bit of this and then cut it off let's disable it so we've got a little tiny bit there to, to demonstrate but you can see that uh, we have a, a second plane now in our render, which is paint export. And this will have the color, the pure color of our materials without any of the lighting. And again, it'll have the, the three components, but it doesn't have an alpha component. So how does Houdini know that paint export is the paint without any lighting attached to it. Well, what we're relying on here is, in fact, that all of the standard shaders that come with the gallery here have a standard set of parameters that they export and that can be picked up as part of this extra image plane's output. And to see this, we can go into the shop context. Let me enlarge this and go, for example, into our reflective material. And we can see that there are some nodes colored green here. And they're diffuse export, specular export, reflection export, opacity export, and somewhere around there will also be paint export. And all these are, are parameter nodes with which are set to invisible, which means that they won't show up in your parameter editor, and set to export always. And if they're set to export, it means that the quantity coming in here for each pixel will be available to be output as an extra image plane. So in this case, we are we, we could input uh, output an extra image plane called paint export. Uh, 
we can output one called diffuse, we can output one called specular, and we can output one called reflection, and we can output one called opacity. And almost all of the gallery materials have those reflection variables enabled. Now, if you write your own shaders, you'll need to be careful to do something similar if you want to use them with the image planes facility on Mantra. So let's go back to our Mantra node. Uh, we've got paint export enabled. Let's enlarge this. I also want to have another image plane, which I'm going to output uh, diffuse, like so. I need to have another image plane on which I'm going to output uh, Excuse me. I'm going to output uh, specular, and in each case, I want a 16 bit float. What have we got now? That's paint, specular, and diffuse. So that's set up to export the main components. I can also export re reflectivity, or rather the reflection. So let me add another image plane, specular paint. Here we are. Now, reflectivity isn't uh, included here as a standard option. You can see it's not listed. But as we saw earlier, if we go into the shop context and have a look at our reflective shader uh, then there is something called REFL export R-E-F-L export so in fact even though it's not listed we can go into our mantra shader and just type in REFL export and I'm going to render this out now to mplay so that we can see all of those uh, separate passes make sure that's 16 bit float as well so we can see all of these extra passes and i'm going to start that off but i'm then going to pause the video because it may take some time so this is started and i'm going to pause the video so here we are with it just finishing off and we can see that we've got our beauty pass, as it's called, our color pass, which combines all of the elements of lighting in our scene. We've then got our specular export, which you probably can't see, but it just has a few specular highlights here. Then we've got our paint export, which is just going to be the plain color and texture of our surface. Then we've got a reflection export, and we can see here the reflection component uh, that is part of our beauty pass. And finally, we've got our diffuse, which is just going to be the diffuse lighting, like so. And we'll demonstrate in a moment how to use the compositor to enable you to adjust the various components that make up that beauty pass uh, so that you can change them without having to re-render. But before we get on to compositing, there are some other passes that we need to look at. I want to add a pass which is going to capture the contribution of global illumination to our lighting. I also want to look at capturing some shadows. And I'm also going to add an ambient occlusion pass, which might be useful later in embedding our object into our beach scene. So let's start with the first of those, which is the contribution of global illumination. And in fact, I've already done a tutorial demonstrating this technique. But uh, what you need to do is add another image plane. Let's go down and find the one that's just been created. Here it is at the end. And we need to use the variable CL. Now CL is the standard variable which stands for light color. 
and it's going to be a vector type. I'm going to make it a 16-bit float output. We can leave the rest at their defaults. And at the bottom here, we can see there's an option to export the variable for each light. And then there's a light mask, so I'm going to select just light 1, which is our global illumination light. And I'm going to render the scene again. And see, we, we can see what the result of this is. And again, I'm going to pause the video. So that's just finishing off. And if we have a look here at the available image planes, we can see that there's a new one, OBJ Light 1 CL. And if we have a look at that, we can see it this it's this vaguely bluey, yellowy picture, and that represents the contribution of the environment map, the environment lighting, the global illumination to the scene. And that's going to be useful later on the composite too.